Hi guys, it is a lovely spring day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization and I have the great honor today to be speaking with one of my heroes and, and, and the man I say is who stole the career that I wanted to have and this is environmental journalist Richard Manning and Richard if you don't recognize the name I believe is the author of at least eight books probably best known for uh, Against the Grain How Agriculture Has Hijacked Civilization and several others um, you might be familiar with with his interview that he had with the excellent documentary, I believe, Life at the End of Empire. I am going to put the link to that extended interview in the description of this video. I highly encourage you folks to uh, to go listen to that. So we're I don't want to just repeat everything in that interview. So we're going to pick up. Uh, where they kind of left off in that interview and we're going to talk about connect some dots between global agriculture overpopulation climate change and the various oncoming global food and water crises and how that's going to play out over the rest of the 21st century and with no further ado Richard Manning say hello and welcome aboard well, thanks, Sam. Thanks for having me. It sounds like a fairly tall order you have it set out for me here. Oh, you can handle it, brother. I have 100% faith in you. So, uh, to start off with, just to bring us up to date, to May 2018, give us the 10-minute the synopsis of Against the Grain, How Agriculture Has Hijacked civilization, some of the main bullets that you uh, talked about in that book to bring us up to this point, and then we're going to put a look into the crystal ball and see how we're going to go from here. Sure. Um, Against the Grain was really my attempt to expand human history in some ways, or the way we think about the human condition. Um, uh, it, we think we know history, we understand history, but in fact, history is is written it's done by civilized people and by civilized we mean literate people who do farming that's that the two things go together um, uh, history didn't arrive until people started farming and that was only six seven thousand years ago probably more like five thousand years ago but uh, really this this thing called human has been around for more like fifty thousand years ten times as long and through the course of our history that 50,000 years, our behavior was very different. The most radical change that ever happened to the human condition occurred when we started farming. And it turned out that that was the most radical condition that happened to the, the planet as well, because uh, domesticated crops eventually took over the planet. <clears throat> and farming itself um, uh, 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 became the largest environmental footprint on the planet. It still is to this day. Uh -huh. Even with all the industrial stuff we do, farming is, is far more consequential. But the, the title of the book really is, is kind of a pun, and it, it, it relies on the fact that we're running against the grain of nature when we do farming. And let me explain that. Uh, farming is, 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 is really the, the act of creating an environmental catastrophe. Um, nature really doesn't like monocultures very much, and so it populates the landscape with biodiversity. Um, perennial plants that exist forever in conjunction with each other. And so if you go look at a native prairie, for instance, which is where we do most of our farming, you'll find about 200 species of plants there. And when we convert that to a cornfield, you'll find one. And it's that vacuum, that reduction to one species, it requires a tremendous amount of energy. Uh, it's just hard work. And it's done in nature by things like fires, uh, catastrophic fires, earthquakes, or never, I shouldn't say earthquakes, volcanoes, things like that that wipe out everything. And then we have these specialized plants called annuals that, that colonize that wiped out terrain. 
and eventually lead to succession and biodiversity again. Mm -hmm. So nature is constantly trying to establish biodiversity. We disrupt that in farming by by allowing that one plant to grow. And, 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 and it, it, when we think of farming, we say, well, no, we grow a lot of different crops. Well, not really. Something like 78% of human nutrition is dependent on three, rice, corn, and wheat. Those three crops alone. Well, it turns out all three of those are annual grasses. The very plants that nature uses to patch up after a catastrophe, but then go away and lead to that biodiversity. So the argument is that the act of creating that catastrophe over and over again on so much of the landscape has depleted our soils, created incredible environmental damage, used an enormous amount of energy, allowed us to overpopulate the globe, and yes, to do civilization, all those things. But we're coming to the end of that process in some ways, the limits of it. And it took 5,000 years to get here, really did. But the, the kinds of problems we talk about today in terms of global warming and depletion of resources and water really been in the works for that long. And they are rooted in that fundamental fact that we're working against the gain of, grain of nature. <clears throat> and even the people, we think about the most intense increase in farming that has occurred um, over the, the course of, of our history. Got a lot of things beeping and ringing. I know the I know the feeling, brother. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Technology uh, occasionally gets a hold of me. It and does. Sure. Any, anyway, got my interviews, but let me see if we can go on with this here a little bit. Um, <laughs> and, and so, at any rate, the problems have been coming have been coming to us for a very long time, and and now they're coming to a head. That um, we are really depleting the landscape to a point that is no longer sustainable. But if we think about the Green Revolution, which is you know, something that really intensified agriculture over you know, the 1940s and so forth, um, uh, the people who did the Green Revolution, and we can actually point to individuals who did that, mostly we point to Norman Borlaug um, as the guy who invented the Green Revolution, which allowed us to overpopulate the world. But it was really the Rockefeller Foundation in a lot of ways. And the Rockefeller Foundation has taken an interesting view on that and some 40 years on they took a look at the results of their revolution the thing they paid for and said this is not working and they said, said what and the head of the rockefeller foundation wrote a wonderful book called uh, arguing for the need for a doubly green revolution in other words we need to make agriculture sustainable now or we're in serious trouble and and when the people who invented the green revolution say no it didn't work um, or it worked, but we need to now tweak it or change it or do a second revolution and give you some idea of how bad the problem is. So uh, and that's kind of the, the thumbnail sketch of what went on. And, 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 but it really, what fascinates me is, is how much of our current problems can be explained by agriculture itself. Okay, so uh, here here we are in in May 2018. So sum up in a couple of minutes. Where are we in uh, in, in May of 2018, and then we're going to go from where are we going to be in May of 2068? <laughs> Yes, this, this global industrial technology. Yeah, uh, um, the question was, can I sum up, I think, um, um, where we are now? And, and it's an interesting position because I've been writing about climate change and global warming for most of my career. Going back to uh, when I started, seriously started on it, when, when Bill McKibben's book came out, The End of Nature. And I was very concerned about nature, and so that got my attention, especially the title. It's probably the most aptly titled book in, in, in a long time. And back then, we used to talk about... This was 1988. What did he write that book in, 88? Yeah, 88. This was 30 yes. years ago. Yeah, exactly, and that's when I read it. And so, um, uh, at the time, I was re really absorbed in nature and wilderness and wilderness politics here in Montana, where I still live. 
And thinking about that and saying, you know, this is a horrible catastrophe that's ahead of us. And he rightly warned us that we ought to be doing some things about this thing that is going to happen in the future. And, and, and that's a long way of saying where we are now is we're no longer there. We're no longer talking about the future. We're no longer even talking about things we might do to stave off this catastrophe. We are living in this rolling catastrophe. Um, I think about it in terms of science, is that, that for a very long time, the people who had science on their side, the scientists, the global, the climate scientists, were actually urging the rest of the world not to do an experiment. And the experiment was this, that if we add all this carbon to the planet, that it will cause a catastrophe. They said, don't do that. Don't do the results of this. But the opponents of that were, were almost more scientific in some ways. They said, no, we're going to go ahead and do that experiment. <laughs> what, they're not, what they're not acknowledging is that it, we don't have a control. We don't have a separate planet to compare the results to and say, no, no, it didn't work out afterwards. We are experimenting with the only planet we have. And we are in, in, in the midst of an experiment that every reasonable scientist in the world tells us was going to be awful. And that's where we are. We're now in the middle of that experiment. The argument about whether or not we are going to do this is over. It's done. And, and also, now, going hand in hand with that over the past 30 years, we have probably close to a, close to a doubling of the population. We have millions, if not a billion people who, are, who have, quote, come out of poverty. I mean, all of these these things are all tied up together, obviously, into the global agricultural system and our ability to to feed ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the population has doubled in my lifetime, and and that's not just a number. I've done a lot of work in Asia and Africa, and, and traveled in places, rural communities that are thoroughly overpopulated. It's not a pretty sight. It's not sustainable in any way, shape, or form. And people who argue otherwise simply had it better. They haven't looked at it. But the, the other thing that's changed during that period of those 40 years or so and is, is, is also, I think, quite interesting, is that people have stopped talking about population. And I, I think that's, that's fascinating. Uh, and a form of denial that it is a little unsettling, not a lot unsettling. Um, so, I'm sorry, we got the, the, the audio kind of broke up right there, so uh, could, could you repeat what you just said about, about the population of the last 40 years? Sure. Um, uh, over the, la the course of the last 40 years, one of the things that's occurred in, in, the, in the national discussion or international discussion of these issues is we have stopped talking about population. And, and in the 60s, part of the environmental movement was zero population growth. And people were actively thinking about ways to diminish population, decrease population. And that's no longer talked about. That's gone. That's removed from our consciousness. And that's a bizarre uh, occurrence, I think, just because um, there's no way we can be in any way hope to be sustainable with 7 billion people on the planet. It, it's not going to work. It's not going to pencil in any way, shape, or form. But we no longer talk about the need to control that population. It's the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, sacred cow uh, taboo out there, apparently, that, that nobody's talking about it. Yeah, absolutely, and I, I, I'm not sure why that is. I mean, then if, if if somebody wants to do an interesting investigation, it's it's um, trace the trace the uh, evolution of the zero population movement and or zero zero ZPG zero population growth movement, and try to come to grips with why that was removed from our discussion because it needs to be there. And, and interestingly enough, a lot of people in the scientific community have discussed it to some degree. And they understand, especially in people who deal in developing world agriculture, that we do have some really good tools for, for limiting population growth. And, and the, the, the unusual thing about them is that they are not as draconian as people thought they were going to be. So the very best tools we have for limiting population growth are educating women and increasing the income of the very poorest people. 
those two things alone will do more to increase or decrease population growth than anything else we can measure. And that's a win-win. I mean, that's a good thing to do, to, to, to educate women and to, to decrease poverty in the world. And why we don't we approach that very directly and do those things is amazing to me. Now, isn't there a, a slippery a slippery slope with uh, decreasing poverty? While that certainly sounds like an excellent humanitarian goal that pretty much anybody would agree with. I mean, there there's a a, a line that certainly in, in in China and more and more in India now we 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 see the slippery slope by where where the overconsumption, the individual ability of, of each one of those human beings. See, you see what I'm saying? Uh, yeah. That that paradox that starts to form. What is your feeling yeah, on, I, on that? That paradox is really interesting in, in that, and you know, we can segment that population from more than just poor and rich. There's a, there's a whole middle class there that, and, and, and what we're talking about is increasing the income of the very poorest mm -hmm, people. Mm -hmm. So when it really gets onerous is when we talk about moving people from uh, middle class to upper middle class in the world. We'll, we'll just use those numbers. So we're talking about people who live on a dollar a day. Yeah. And when you talk about people who live on $10 a day and take them up to 15 or something like that, that's when those effects occur. The effects being the increased consumption, especially meat consumption, but they buy a car then, they start burning gas, transportation, those kinds of issues all come into play. When you take them from a dollar a day to two dollars a day, they have access to things like clean water, uh, ad adequate number of calories, and uh, especially things like birth control and some choices. There's some choices in their life. So. The, the, the increase happens in the very lowest income groups. That's what limits population growth. And, and that's where it needs to happen. And yeah, those consumption issues are there, but we deal with those. So if we look at Europe, um, Europe is really good at population control. Europe is now close to zero population growth unless we add in immigration. Most of their population growth is now coming from immigration. Europe also has a, a, a consumption patterns that look pretty good compared to the rest of the world in things of per capita energy consumption and, and things like their transportation network, stuff like that. So we, we've got a model for this. And if we made the rest of the world look like, say, Spain or Italy, we'd be a lot better off. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'd I, I say, again, I could, I, I could continue this, this conversation uh, uh, about overpopulation. Anybody who knows me knows uh, my, my number one thing I want to talk about. But we're 18 minutes into this uh, on the Collapse Chronicles. So let's, uh, let's kind of change the direction of this conversation, uh, looking ahead. And I, and I usually like to choose chunks of about 50 years. So, finally, even in the mainstream media, unbelievably, uh, I have noticed that even the mainstream media is admitting uh, about a looming global food and fresh water crisis, although they're not, they're not tying overpopulation anywhere into that uh, conversation. They are at least tying climate change into it. So what I want to do, probably for the balance uh, of, of this uh, conversation we're having, is get your, your analysis and your dot connecting between overpopulation and climate change and what that's going to mean for global food and fresh water supplies uh, over the next 50 years and what your vision of, of how this is going to play out uh, you know, over the balance of this century. So just just run with that for a, a while, Richard Manning. Sure. Um, so, and, and that, that exercise generally gets into predictive uh, stuff about, okay, um, it, catastrophe is looming in food. And what will that look like? And a bunch of people are going to starve to death. That usual kind of analysis that goes on on that. I think that's missing an important point, although it's completely valid. I mean, the, our food supply is incredibly brittle. 
for a number of reasons. One is because we rely on three crops alone. That's putting all your food in one basket, um, all your eggs in one basket. And there are actually three baskets, so that's not very many. And that brittle nature of the food supply is incredibly responded to weather. So if Australia loses its wheat crop, people go hungry. And we're already there. We know that. Um, if the Mideast erupts in crisis, as it's doing right now, um, all its crops fail and people go hungry. <laughs> there are those issues. But I've got a different analysis that I'm thinking a lot about lately, and oddly enough, related directly to one of your earlier guests, Paul Ehrlich. And, and that's the context I like to think about um, the whole crisis. And Paul Ehrlich is in some ways ridiculed because oh, he, he... He's barbecued. Uh, anyway. <laughs> yeah, for, for, for predicting a crisis, though. Mm -hmm. So we can remember back in the 60s, at least I'm old enough to remember back in the 60s, when he was a regular feature on the Johnny Carson show. And, and it was because of his book, The Population Bomb, saying increased population is going to lead to widespread starvation now. And he was, he was very, very firm in that prediction. Well, that didn't happen. And that's why he's ridiculed. But I think that, that, that criticism is really shallow. <clears throat> um, and, 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 and they say the analysis is that Ehrlich missed that catastrophe because he missed the Green Revolution. In other words, that was at the very time we, we began producing so much more food off um, those, those crops that I talked about earlier. And that's true. The yields of those crops went through the ceiling, right then through the use of pesticides and chemical fertilizers. And so he missed that yield increase, but here's what he didn't miss. Um, and, 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 and we don't have to talk about the future at all in this, that we are in the midst of catastrophe right now. It's all around us. And walk through any public space, especially in any public space where um, poor people in the United States tend to congregate, go to a Walmart or something like that, and look at the obesity. Uh -huh. Say, so, wait a minute. Well, well, that's not a food crisis. Those people are eating too much. No, that's not true. That is malnutrition. You're looking at widespread malnutrition. And, and malnutrition is defined as not inadequate food. It's, it's defined as bad food. Mal, bad food. And the fact that we're eating corn and wheat solely has led to this glut of carbohydrates in our diet that is malnourishing people. That is the catastrophe. And it's not only manifested in this, but in things around metabolic syndrome. So um, heart disease, diabetes. Um, diabetes, type 2 diabetes was unheard of a generation ago. It is now an epidemic. And what's going on with that? That's malnutrition. The point is that the Green Revolution taught us to grow only those few crops that produce a lot of carbohydrates, like corn, like rice, like wheat. And the human diet, going back to that 50,000 years ago, is really diverse, and it needs micronutrients, it needs protein, it especially needs high-quality fats. Those things are so lacking from our diet that we are not only becoming obese and sick as a result of it, people are starting now to die Poor people are dying in the United States at a much younger age because of a poor diet that they have. But I think it's, expect, it's, it's, it's greatly affecting brain health, that we are not reaching our potential because our brains are malnourished. The most important and energetically demanding organ in our body is malnourished. So we're in the midst of a catastrophe brought on by a crisis in agriculture, and nobody recognizes it. The irony of it is, it is, it's hampering our ability to deal with crisis and our ability to deal with the problems that are now facing us because of the general poor health and especially the brain health that comes from this state of malnutrition. Uh, and so, in a, in, a, in a really important way, Paul Ehrlich was right that the way we grow food will lead to widespread catastrophe. It is not a future issue. It is with us today. 
So we have just, st starting with the uh, President of the United States with his Big Mac and, and Coca-Cola diet, Right on. We have we have an epidemic of stupidity as as well as obesity. That I mean, all joking aside, uh, and 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 this is it is part of the reason maybe that we are not going to be able to rise to the challenge that we're being faced with. Yeah, I think it's a huge part of the reason. I mean, just look at a very small slice of this now. The military has a hard time recruiting people because of the obesity crisis. Um, it can recruit, but people tend to be fat, especially young people, and then have the problems that go with that. Um, poor physical activity, uh, poor control, things like that. So our, our military is less able in some ways just because of the obesity crisis. And that's just a, a small segment of what, what I'm talking about that people are less able to achieve their human potential because our nutrition is so bad. Uh, but uh, beyond that, look at how we spend money on our health care crisis. If we were to take away diabetes, heart disease, and obesity, our health care expenditures would drop astronomically. Astronomically. Go to any doctor's office in the country, take a look at the waiting room, see who's waiting for medical care. Um, and and it's, it's, it's malnutrition. Mm -hmm. It's an effect of malnutrition. And almost no doctor will ask you what you eat. But what we eat is the industrial American diet, the thing that, that the Green Revolution cooked up for us. And if you eat the average American diet, you will get sick. You will die early. I, 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 re, I resemble that remark, Richard. <laughs> it, it, so, uh, that, that is certainly, was certainly one of the, uh, the, the many crises. Uh, let's talk about... Um, well, as I say, what is showing up in the mainstream media, and if you could give us some more intelligent analysis uh, of uh, of the surface they are talking about, uh, let's start with the the global food shortage. Are we or are we not going to have just literally have enough food to feed? Uh, the the population of this planet over the balance of this century is it going to are we or are we not going to figure out how to do that? No, we're not. We and we're already failing. We're failing drastically. And um, the people who say we're not failing will give you a number. We need two thousand calories per day, or whatever the number they choose to use. And they say, well, and then they'll. they'll they'll look at corn production and wheat production and they'll divide that out and say by 7 billion people here's how many tons we have therefore we have these 2,000 calories per day. Um, first of all that's not adequately distributed now so the poorest people don't have that access to those calories but my, my larger argument is that, that those, that's not adequate. That's not a good way to measure human nutrition is 2,000 calories a day of carbohydrates. That's what makes us sick because we're not getting enough fats. We're not getting especially omega-3 fats. Now, here's a good example. Omega-3 fats are, are really vital for brain health um, to, to, to achieve your human p potential. And people started figuring that out a few years ago and say, where do they come from? Omega-3 fats. Well, they come largely from animal fats. There are a few choices, um, but mostly from grass-fed beef and cold-water fish. And so some British people took a look at it and said, British scientists, and said, okay, if we needed to supply uh, an adequate uh, amount of omega-3 fats to all the world's population, how many fish would that take? Well, they calculated we would overfish the world's supply of fish in a matter of a couple of years. Um, and, and that's critical for brain development. Everybody understands that, but we just don't have enough of that. We don't have enough vegetables. We don't, people don't eat enough carrots and spinach and all that stuff because we don't raise them anymore. We raise corn and wheat. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the diet that we have now is wholly inadequate. And the, 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 even in a narrow sense, that 2,000 calories a day of corn or wheat or whatever is so fragile and so right on the edge that any catastrophe will upset that. But in the midst of that, there's a really curious development. 
and 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 so everybody's saying, well, you know, especially in, in the Midwest, people argue, well, we need every inch of our American farmland to grow feed, food to feed the world. And if we don't feed the world, there will be starvation. And it turns out that um, corn, our most important crop, American agriculture is corn. That's it. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you if, if you take corn, soybeans, and wheat, you've taken care of almost all the subsidy, all the acreage, all the money we spend, all the pesticides, fertilizer, all that stuff. That's agriculture. And 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 with cause. I mean, that really is feeding all our livestock. That's feeding the world in some way. That's the, the ingredient in processed food that's giving us two thousand calories. The, so the, the, just, 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 I just want to make sure people the, the soybeans is not going to vegans eating tofu. It's going to factory farmed uh, chickens mostly. I would assume. Is that yeah, correct? Chickens and hogs. Chickens and hogs, especially because hogs need a protein source. And, and there's an argument. There's a really interesting avenue in that, but. Uh, 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 but at any rate, all those things are, are feeding livestock, and people say we need that to feed the world. Well, what happened? There was a revolution in the Midwest in the last twenty years, actually more like ten years, that people uh, is completely ignored, unreported, and any ag economist working in international agriculture over the last twenty years would be unable to predict it. Say this is impossible. This could not happen. Well, it did happen. Forty percent, forty percent of the American corn crop now goes into ethanol. Our most important crop is going into gasoline tanks, not people's stomachs. We're not feeding people with it at all. So that's it's push up the price of corn for the poorest people in the world who need it for food can't eat it because it's going into our gasoline tanks and it makes a mockery of the whole argument of we're really growing food and in, mm -hmm. in our agriculture lands we're not we're growing fuel for automobiles and we're destroying the planet in the process of doing it so we're increasing global warming so so biofuels uh, i just love that word biofuels uh yeah. it, 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 so Without breaking our, our 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 train of thought too much, just just do a quick roundup of your opinion on biofuels as a uh, as a way to save the planet from uh, fossil fuels. Yeah, biofuels is that kind of lump category that includes ethanol, which I'm talking, but also includes things like made from waste, things like methane, wood waste, made from wood waste or from manure, that kind of thing or recycled oils, uh, cooking oils, stuff like that, and all lumped in the category mm -hmm. of biofuels. And, and, and if you think about it, that's a nice, warm, fuzzy term that everybody can get into. Fuel from life, right? Biofuels. <laughs> well, if you have an industry like the corn industry, they're going to take a warm, fuzzy term like that and use it as a shield against what they're really doing. And that's exactly what has happened. Almost all of our biofuel production is ethanol almost all of it, like 90%, that, that range. And there is nothing sustainable about it. In fact, there, there is an argument, it uses more energy than it creates. Mm -hmm. It is a way to take our corn crop and hide it in the gasoline tanks. And so it has diverted the argument, and there's still people who think, well, ethanol is a real good thing because it comes from farm fields. Farm fields are not a good thing, and anything we can do to, to diversify agriculture and make it sustainable uh, would be our benefit. Corn is not it. Growing corn is the exactly opposite direction we need to go in. If we were to convert those same corn fields that are now growing fuel for our gasoline tanks to permanent pastures, those permanent pastures would do things like create topsoil, sequester carbon, and grasslands are very good at sequestering carbon in the soil, probably better than forest. They would control floods, catastrophic flood. They would provide omega-3 fats to people's diets, and they would, in effect, make agriculture more sustainable. But instead, we grow corn for ethanol. <laughs> Uh, okay. As I say again, I would I could do a, a, a full hour interview on the biofuel industry, but there's so yeah. many things. Let's get back on to the the global food supply, and then I want to wind up with the 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 fresh water 
supply over the next year. So what are the biggest threats to the global food supply? I'm reading it as too many mouths eating the food uh, and, and, and climate change. Would, would you agree yeah. those are the two, the two big ones? Yeah, absolutely, and, and very difficult to predict. So, but one of the things that's going on with climate change, which was predicted 30 years ago, and it's certainly happening, is widespread drought. And the, that drought can, if you have drought that stretches all across Oklahoma and Texas and, and uh, Missouri and goes on for a number of years, that has a huge effect on food production. There's no doubt about it. Um, the one that we didn't predict um, was too much water, and that's happening as well, especially in the Midwest. So uh, a couple of years ago, I did a story on the dairy industry moving to southern Idaho, and southern Idaho is a desert. It's the last place in the world we ought to be doing the dairy industry, but it has extensive irrigation, and so the water supply was completely predictable. They could count on that. So people were moving dairy cows from the Midwest and from Central California, especially in the Midwest where it was, where it was sustainable in some small way, to a desert where it was not because the water supply was predictable. The reason was there was too much water in the Midwest. We were getting catastrophic rainstorms that came through, and that's become the rule. So that's going to affect our food supply as well. Um, well, there are knock-on effects that people didn't predict. One is the ability of insects to overwinter. And we don't see it so much in agriculture where I live in Montana, but we've seen it in trees, in forestry, that we have areas where you can stand on top of a mountain and look on a horizon line where you can see 40 miles away and see nothing but dead trees. Mm -hmm. That's the result of pine beetles. The pine beetles were over, able to overwinter because the winters are warmer and therefore we're able to attract the trees and they killed them all. That kind of insect problem is showing up in agriculture as well. So there's these knock-on effects, uh, less water to deal with, all those things that we thought were going to happen are happening and some things we didn't think were going to happen are happening and all of them are falling out of our brittle food supply. So what's the what 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 is your vision of our uh, of our total food supply fifty years from now? Are we going to have the same amount of food we do now to feed the people that are going to be here then? Are we going to have more, as the as the GMO techno utopians would say, or, or are we going to have less, as the doomers would say? Where where do you line yourself up on the spectrum? Yeah, I worry more far more about our content. The, uh, the food supply than the overall supply. In, in other words, we, uh, there was a, sci a bad science fi fiction movie from the, I don't know, the 80s maybe about soil and green and we're all eating chemistry in the end and it wasn't all that good. Well, that's where we are. We're eating chemistry now. We're not eating food. And that's the only way we have got to the point we're at now. And so for particularly the world's poorest people, um, if they have food at all, it's going to be a grain gruel, you know, something put together in rice and wheat or something like that. That's what's happening now. I mean, you don't have to go. You don't have to go to the future to predict that. You can see it all over the world. Um, the, the bifurcation that's going on in the world's population between rich and poor is going to show up in food. And that the rich people will still have adequate nutrition and all that stuff. They'll be able to buy it. Everybody else will be. Uh, either eating inadequate diets or starving. Um, and yeah, there's what we have today in terms of agriculture is not sustainable under normal situations, under normal situations, where we are. But normal is all over with. We are now in global warming, so it is doubly unsustainable. And not only that, it is exacerbating global warming. The way we grow food makes global warming worse because it, it, it's, it's um, energy intensive, we use a lot of energy, but it depletes the carbon in the soil. So carbon that was sequestered in soil is now released into the atmosphere, and that adds to global warming. Um, yeah, there's, there's, I, I can't make hard predictions. You know, look, look at the trouble that I got Paul. Hey, really? 
<laughs> He's a lot smarter than I am. So, but um, um, generally, and, and anybody who tries to predict what's going to happen in the next 10, 15 years is going to be off the mark. We're going to miss it because we're on the edge of chaos now. When thing, at tipping points start happening, and we're going to see tipping points. We're going to see things that are highly unpredictable. Things like the hurricanes that have happened in, uh, in, in, in the Gulf Coast over the last few years. Those are tipping point events that nobody really predicted, but when they happen, all hell breaks loose. That's what's going to ripple through our food supply. So you, you don't you don't want to make a pr prediction uh, of how many people are actually going to be around to be eating whatever food we have left to eat by the end of this century. No, no, I, I don't blame I, I you, brother. I just <laughs> back to the fact that, that uh, I watch nature a lot in the ecosystem. Well, we're not we're not exempt from those rules. We think that our technology is exempt us from natural limitations, but it hasn't. And uh, environmentalists a few years ago were fond of a slogan saying, nature bats last. Well, that's what's going to happen. We have these kind of problems, and nature has a way of solving them. It's not pretty, and it's not going to be something humans like, but they will be solved. They will be solved, and, and the balance gets put back in place at some point. Okay, before we, we, we wind up on your fresh water forecast, you, you've mentioned technology a couple of times, and I always like to uh, do, do nod my head to what I call the techno-utopian. So, GMOs, and now I guess the, the warm and fuzzy word is gene editing. Uh, not, it's not modifying, we're editing. GMOs and gene editing are that is that going to be the second green revolution that is going to sustainably feed a planet of 10 billion people as the monsanto folks would want us to believe what's your response to that yeah it, it's not um I, and i spent several years uh working on that very issue i especially worked under contract to the rockefeller foundation and that was the basis of it. that was the question we looked at bioengineering, we looked at plant breeding, the things that were going on to enhance uh, food production and the quality of our foods in some ways with both genetic engineering and uh, plant breeding. And it turns out that conventional plant breeding, which we've done for thousands of years, is, is in some ways all, every bit as powerful as genetic engineering, that we can do things there. But they oddly enough found the most gains in getting some resilience in their plants. And in, in the developing world, we'll talk about resilience. We don't talk about it in our world because in the industrial world because we control all the conditions. But in places like India, um, they're really interested in having plants to survive the punches of global warming. And they, and they found out that they could do that by going back to some wild ancestors. So um, there are native grasses growing in Asia that are the predecessors of rice. And if they went back and bred their rice with the, the current varieties of rice with those native ancestors, they got some resilience that was kind of cool. And it was resilience against drought. Um, and, and it was also brought back some micronutrients that were available um, in the soils that made them healthier. So they're real gains made by doing that kind of breeding and engineering. It is not the sort of gain that will increase yields on the levels that we're talking about. There's nothing out there that's going to do that. Including G GMOs and gene editing. Yeah, yeah, and, 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 and the really interesting fundamental idea behind that is what created the Green Revolution. And as I said, there was enormous gains in yield in the Green Revolution, that we went you know, like five times as much corn from a single plant that we used to get. And I did that, not so much with corn, but with both rice and wheat with a very simple trick. It's called dwarfing. And all they did was make wheat and rice shorter, much shorter plants, so they had more energy to devote to the seed head. Mm -hmm. And not only that, because they were short, the seed head could be heavier, so, and it wouldn't tip over uh, the problem called lodging. And all those things taken together, a lot of them use chemical fertilizers, irrigation, stuff like that to really amp up the yield. Okay, that was a one-shot deal. 
there there's no more blood in the turn, turnip here. You can't make plants any shorter still and make them more productive. Not only that, they found out something quite interesting. In trying to make drought tolerant plants, all they said, well, we need longer roots. So if we make these plants have long roots, then they'll be drought tolerant because they can go down in the soil and get the water. And drought tolerance is everything in the developing world. They found out that the same gene controlled the height of the plant, it's controlled the depth oh, of the plant. Yeah, the roots. Yeah. It can't be done. It's impossible. So there's just no more gains to be made in that except for little marginal gains. 10% here, 5% there. That's a big deal. But nothing like the tripling that went on. The Green Revolution was a one-shot deal, and there's nothing on the horizon, not in engineering, not in plant breeding, not in the agronomic techniques that will match that at all. Okay, and you've mentioned the word irrigation uh, many times in this conversation, and so let's use that as our segue into the, the, the final subject we're going to have time just to barely touch on, and that is the deteriorating global fresh water forecast, just to meet the, 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 the water needs of this expanding mm -hmm. population. So start with irrigation and give it, give your five minute, uh, your, your five minute spiel on, on, on that and how the water wars are going to play out over the, the balance of this century and then we will wrap it up. Yeah, there, there are a couple things to consider there. One is supply and that's what people normally consider and there, there are no forecasters in freshwater supply who are optimistic uh, that the, 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 the widespread drought, especially in areas like Sub-Saharan Africa, the Mideast, Australia um, are really influences supply. California will be the, the bellwether for that in the United States. We'll look at that and we'll say, oh yeah, we're running out of water in California. And indeed we are. So those issues are there. Uh, there's some gains made through efficiency. We, we irrigate terribly inefficiently because water is cheap and plentiful. And now the places like Israel have figured out ways to irrigate using less water. Um, we wasted a bunch of water and things like bluegrass lawns and golf courses that we can capture that and hope to do better. Uh, so there'll be fits and starts in that, but generally the long trend will be toward less water. And, and, and certainly that's going to be a limit. But there's something else to consider in this, that, that irrigation itself is fundamentally pretty unsustainable. And it's unsustainable in a number of ways. If we look at uh, the, the best way to do that argument is say Iraq war. Um, you know, well, I thought the Iraq war was about oil. Well, really, no. The whole Mideast is where irrigation started um, in, in terms of the, the Western civilization. And you can go to China and look at irrigation and, and Chinese rice fields and say, okay, yeah, there's a separate development there. In both those areas, a couple things happen. One is that, that irrigated societies tend to be incredibly autocratic. Um, that's where dictators show up. That's where um, things like Chinese dynasties show up over the years. They control their people in not very pleasant places to live. And, and, and that was true in the Middle East and ancient times when it was irrigated. It, it was full of dictators and autocrats and, and suppression of people and, and slavery. Those things tended to go hand in hand. But the other thing that happened is irrigation depletes the soil. So you put so much water on it that it leaches out all the minerals and so forth, and that soil depletes. And that's what's going on in Mideast right now. Mideast was the breadbasket of the world a thousand years ago. That's where we grew. That's where wheat was domesticated. That's where we've been doing farming, irrigated agriculture the very longest in places like Iraq, and literally Iraq. And those places are now so depleted that they're, they're full of violence. Be, and it's, they're full of violence because there is no bread. It's that simple. And, and that's what we're ignoring in all of this, that the lands where we have done farming the longest are the most unstable lands in the world, oh, right. with the exception of China, which is now converted to, to, to um, China has converted to industry, and so is less dependent on it. But certainly places, Afghanistan, the Mideast, Eastern Europe, those are where we did agriculture the longest, and that's no coincidence that irrigated agriculture over time 
depletes the soils and depletes human societies to the degree that is simply not sustainable. And your your vision of uh, how climate change is going to uh, be playing into the the water situation through drought, through mostly through widespread drought punctuated by catastrophic flooding. Oddly enough, that sounds contradictory, but it's not. Um, even where I live, that's that's what we're living with. So our water supply is, is completely unpredictable now. Um, it just it, it, we, all hell breaks loose and we flood like crazy or we're in drought and we're on fire for years where I live north but that's true around the world and and we just don't know but one of the wild cards in this and when people were calculating these issues 30 years ago they were really confident in predicting drought worldwide but we didn't really get into the idea that we have a hotter planet puts more water in the atmosphere just through evaporation. So there's more water up there falling as catastrophic storms. And how that works out precisely is, is just too complex to predict. We'll find out. Oh, yeah. We'll find out. Probably. We're doing the experiment. Yeah, Remember? we're in the middle of the experiment. The results yeah. will be in in 50 years. So anyway, Richard Manning, we are... Good Lord, we're over 50 minutes. So how I always end up these now I want you to I want you to stick around and hopefully we can talk about something else for a few minutes later. But for this interview, how I like to end up the these interviews is okay, you're not talking to Collapse Chronicles on YouTube. You have your 60 second sound bite on the mainstream media to send out Richard Manning's message to the world in 2018. What is your 60 second message to the world, Richard Manning? The 60 second message to the world. Um, I, I've been thinking about this a lot lately and it's, it, it comes out to, de to denial. And we use that word um, lightly, but we forget that it comes from Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and analysis of how we deal with death. And that's where we are. We, uh, we, we think we're denying global warming. What we're really denying is death. And that there will be a remaking here. And what we need to realize is that going forward, the one thing that will be true is none of us will get the world she expects. We all have expectations. We all say, this is what the world is going to be like, or this is what I want it to be like. I want green trees. I want nice weather. I want clear skies, all that stuff. That's not going to happen. What is going to happen is things are going to get a lot worse. And life will never be the same again. And that fundamental, simple fact just has not occurred to us. It's not sinking in in our society. We're not understanding that what we think of as life is no longer tenable. All right. Well, there is the, uh, the, 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 the bottom line message. On, on, on my sister channel, uh, I have a four-word description of that, which I don't, I, I, I don't use here on Collapse uh, Chronicles. Again, st stick around for a minute after this, but yep. Richard Manning, we absolutely appreciate you taking an hour out of your uh, busy schedule. I can tell by all the phone calls and beeping and ringing that you that you lead probably a busier life than you want to dealing with uh, people like me, and we really appreciate uh, everything that you do to uh, to spread the word about what's coming down on this planet. And thank you very much for, for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. All right, guys. We will be back next week with uh, with another voice from, from the collapse. For this interview with Richard Manning, bye, guys.